so how did you get how did you get into motor racing first of all <coughs> well i uh, whilst i was in the uh, air force uh, my uh, father um, advanced some money so that i could buy myself uh, a sports car yes uh, and um, I bought uh, a TAMG, but uh, that was a great mistake. It had been a police car and I'd done um, tens of thousands of miles and uh, I immediately replaced that with a Morgan 44, which is yes. uh, uh, a company Climax engine. I kept that, I expect, for um, I think uh, three or four years and uh, uh, put it in for sprints yes. and um, uh, into competition generally, a lot of it um, in the Bristol area because right. I was uh, stationed in the uh, Air Force um, at um, uh, Locking, near Locking. Yes, near Western Supermare. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, the uh, clubs in the West seemed to be um, uh, very enthusiastic uh, trials yes. uh, people and uh, consequently I started going into uh, um, uh, that competition down there. And you were starting to take an interest in, in local events. Yeah. Uh, Bristol Light Car Club events. And That's I right. Think, yes. Yeah. yes. Um, sprints, hill climbs. Sprints, um, uh, hill climbs later on, yes. Prescott. Prescott. Uh, I think only Prescott, actually. I don't think I ever went to, uh, ever competed at Shelsby. There was a hill climb, there was a very early hill climb at um, Gordano or... Um, yes, I didn't go there. No, no. Um, now that was with the Morgan, with the Coventry Climax engine. Yeah. Um, what did you move on to? What was your next stage? <coughs> the next stage was that... Um, I uh, wanted to have a uh, more competitive car and um, uh, I'd seen uh, publicity about the first uh, Cooper MG yes. Yes. and uh, I went down to see John Cooper and uh, ordered uh, one of his uh, sports car chassis uh, into which um, I fitted an MG engine right. and um, uh, competed with that for a little while. Yes. Uh, but. Um, it left a, a bit to be desired. It was too heavy for a start. Mm. <coughs> and uh, at about that time, John Tajiro, who lived <coughs> uh, just outside Cambridge, mm. um, he um, was bringing in parts for us to make for uh, a chassis that uh, he was uh, making based on the Cooper. Yes. And um, naturally enough, I uh, was very interested in that and said, well, I um, think I'd um, like to order one of your chassis because I've got an idea of a car with a very good powder weight ratio, which with your chassis and a Jap engine, J Presswich, uh, would give us a uh, pretty marvellous powder weight ratio. So the Tejero chassis was a double tubular chassis. Uh, yeah, and it was parallel like, tubes. Uh, parallel tubes, and it was um, independent... Yeah, all, all the way around. Based on it was um, a, a Cooper yes. inspired. So transver yeah. transverse leaf spring. Yeah. Um, and all independent. Yeah. So pretty pretty advanced for its day. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we fitted this uh, Jap engine in uh, with a uh, Jarrett Jupiter gearbox. Yes. Um, and um, uh, a very very light body. And uh, I entered into uh, various events, but um, I came to the conclusion that um, I wasn't really made to be a racing driver. Yes. Uh, and uh, at one of the events, I was up against a chap in a TDMG, perfectly standard TDMG. Yes. Uh, on the um, on one of the dispersal areas at uh, Bottisham Aerodrome, just outside Cambridge. And uh, that, of course, was Archie. And he got, I don't know what the uh, circuit time was, I can't remember, but if it was, say, 60 seconds, uh, I possibly did it in 59 seconds, and yes. Archie was 
more or less 60 seconds, you know, and he ought really to have been quite a bit slower than that, or conversely, I should have been faster. So you had a purpose-built racing car, yeah. and he had an off-the-shelf, he had a yeah. standard TD, which yeah. was a heavy. Yeah, so I um, uh, offered uh, the uh, uh, jet to Archie to drive yes. uh, through uh, that season. I yes. think that was the end of 52, but he was driving it anyway. Uh, through 53, yes, and uh, was spectacularly successful in his class whilst uh, the engine lasted. Yes, because that was the um, uh, drawback with that arrangement. The um, no one could get the Jap engine uh, to be com uh, reasonably reliable. Right, but I mean, he was uh, uh, he went in for the 1100 uh, CC sports car events. And uh, he was even lapping some people in a five-lap event. Yes, crikey. And he had a remarkable driving style. Was that apparent even then? Um, well, it was apparent that he was bloody quick. You yes. Know, I, um, I didn't analyse too much what his style was, but yes. it was, it was uh, obviously uh, very determined and uh, uh, exceptionally well-balanced. From that relationship, um, I um, realised that uh, the Jap wasn't the car that was going to... Uh, uh, it was spectacular enough, but it wasn't going to uh, make my name or anything. And, of course, I um, wanted to bring the company, uh, George Lister and Sons Limited, uh, into motor racing because uh, that would be a marvellous way, I thought of uh, publicising one's uh, engineering abilities. And um, I uh, put it to my father that uh, I would like uh, to use the facilities of the company uh, to build a chassis. And uh, that's when he said, uh, uh, right, you've got six months yes. and or 1,500 quid right. of uh, expenditure. And if you haven't proved anything, uh, when the money runs out, or when the time runs out, uh, then you'll forget it. Right. Well, I managed to build a chassis in that time, and uh, we were able to get it to an aerodrome without a body on or anything like that. And it seemed to, um, it seemed to handle very well. Mm. And uh, I therefore squeezed a bit more uh, money from uh, the company <coughs> to put a body on it. And that was the uh, Lister MG. Right. Its right. first race was at Snetterdon. And um, we won it, I think. I can't remember. I think yes. we won it. It's in the book yes. anyway. Yes, and Archie, and Archie was driving. Archie was driving, yes. yes. It was a success for the company because it was promotion. It was yep. m marketing. It was advertising. Um, at that stage, did you get any um, any sponsorship from other firms? Uh, not really. One has to, uh, in those days, you had to prove yourself before you got uh, sponsorship. Uh, but that was, um, as I remember, I think the first race was uh, at the end of March in uh, 54. And it was about the same time that um, both Colin Chapman came on the scene yes. uh, with his aerodynamic car and uh, Peter Gammon, I don't know if you remember him, he had uh, Lotus, a uh, standard Lotus, Lotus 7 I think it was, yes. and he was very, very quick. And uh, Archie, with all his skills and everything, found it um, d not difficult to keep up with them, but certainly difficult to uh, uh, pass them. And um, that's when... Uh, after a, um, uh, a period of running the car for a few weeks, I said to my father, I think we should do something about um, a more powerful engine. Uh, and of course, it was also the time that Archie had been in for the Empire Trophy. Yes. Uh, when he was banned because uh, the insurers, I think, for the circuit um, would have been uh, uh, reluctant to pay out if there'd been an accident without 
special dispensation from the RSE, and he had got a competition license, uh, but he hadn't got... Um, because he had, he had a, quite a severe disability from birth. Yeah. Yes, which not, wasn't apparent. It's not apparent in the photographs. It's not apparent in the photographs, but his um, uh, right arm ended in a stump uh, where his uh, wrist uh, would be, but he could control a car uh, by pushing it yes. on the steering wheel and uh, using it almost like a... Um, uh, the driver of a um, steamroller would, you know, right, with swinging it round, swinging it round yes. very quickly. Um, the car had the MG had shown promise, and I went to uh, my father and said, um, uh, "I would like to go ahead uh, with a more powerful engine," and um, he uh, gave the OK on that. And that was the beginning of the Bristol, list of Bristol. So you went to, you then went to Bristol's. We, I think probably I wrote to them in the first instance. Yes. Uh, and of course, uh, in those days, they would have followed what was happening in motor racing. They would have heard of us anyway. Yes, yes. Um, John Tejiro had, uh, by that time, built <coughs> uh, Cliff Davis's car. Yes. Uh, uh, using a Bristol engine. And um, they uh, agreed to uh, supply us with an engine. I can't remember who I dealt with. Them. So what, what year would this have been? This uh, would be uh, <coughs> around April 1954. Yes, yes. A standard competition engine, I expect so, they'd call but it. Perhaps a BS model? Can't remember. Right, right. But you, so you, 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 you took that engine in. Yeah, and, and gearbox. And gearbox. And did you use them as standard, or did you wave a magic wand over them? Um, well, by this time, uh, Don Moore, who had prepared both the Jap and the MG engine, and who I knew <coughs> to be a uh, very competent um, engine development yes. man, although he was comparatively... Uh, like the rest of us unknown at the time. Yes. And uh, he uh, dismantled uh, the engine and uh, sorted out uh, the lineup of the ports and everything like that. Yes. One yes, does sir. polishing valves and uh, the um, inlets and everything and balancing all the bits and pieces. Yes. And um, also his exhaust system, <coughs> the theory there was that all the pipes uh, to the expansion box or boxes <coughs> should be of equal length. Yes. The theory being that the uh, gases don't arrive um, together, which there's a danger of that happening if you get a, a pipe sort of yes, three indeterminate one. length. Yes, yes. And um, we... Uh, the first race we entered for was, in fact, at Orton Park. And uh, we had decided to use a uh, radiator. I've forgotten who made them. They were for competition work. And uh, the uh, water pump on the uh, Bristol <coughs> was um, uh, so efficient that it was trying to push the cooling water through the radiator too quickly. Yes. And uh, it was just coming out through the, um, uh, through the uh, valve on the um, uh, filler cap. Yes. Uh, so we did a, uh, we couldn't uh, run in that race. Uh, so we did a uh, very quick change. I think we used a Morris Oxford uh, radiator, if I remember correctly. And uh, that worked perfectly. And the next race that we went in for uh, with the Bristol was the big uh, sports car race at the uh, British Grand Prix. Yes. And in fact, Archie finished, uh, I think, fifth overall amongst all the uh, D-types yes. and uh, the Astons and everything. Yes. Uh, and uh, 
it, the race was broadcast. My father was listening to it, and he had the name Lister mentioned yes. <coughs> quite a few times yes, yes. <coughs> by Raymond Baxter, who was talking about this <coughs> remarkable driver and car. And so he was sold. You know, he, that that was it. That got that. Got the, so dad was <coughs> dad. Dad was hooked. Yeah. Did you design the car round him? Because he was quite small, wasn't he? Uh, he had short legs. He had. We we had certain features, design features, <coughs> which were really inspired by having to make accommodation for him. Yes. Uh, the principal one <coughs> were the pedals, because uh, with his very short legs. Yes. Uh, if one had brought the pedals back to where he would be comfortable, uh, normal pedals, then no one else would better drive the car. Yes. And as we wanted other people to drive the car, I uh, came up with the idea of um, uh, having uh, uh, pedals <coughs> with uh, parallel sleeve arms at the back, connected by uh, tubes at the top. Yes. And uh, those tubes had um, tubes within them uh, where you could uh, uh, extend them backwards by taking out pins and putting the pins back in. Yes. Uh, and uh, that was um, a feature of uh, a lot of the list of cars. Right, right. Which uh, were inspired by wanting to give Archie every opportunity, but at the same time, making the car suitable for other people. The listers were, were adjustable in that sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, the seats weren't adjustable, which was another advantage of doing that. Yes. Uh, because there was very little extra weight in this pedal arrangement. Sure. Uh, but to uh, have some kind of seat adjustment um, uh, would have, uh, um, you'd have given away just as much weight uh, by having a seat adjustment, as you would by having uh, these um, these pedals, so it, that had the advantage of simplifying uh, the uh, the seating arrangements. Yes, and um, generally, uh, it, it was quite successful. So, how do things move on? How do things go from then on? <coughs> well, uh, through the uh, season, as I say, he uh, uh, raced. Um, in numerous races, and uh, one of the modifications we made was in the interest of lightness and simplicity and everything, we uh, took the, uh, which you could do in those days, you could race <coughs> without headlamps. Yes. Didn't have to have those, so we modified the car uh, like that and did uh, various other lightning jobs. and. Um, the most sensational thing was that Archie went back to the Empire Trophy yes. uh, the next year, the one that he'd been uh, banned from in 54. He went there in 55 and he won the race, yes. which of course was quite sensational. I mean, the, uh, the national press got hold of it. Banned driver in 54 wins this prestigious race and in fact I've got the um, uh, Autosport um, which reports on that race. I don't know if you've seen that, have you? It would be great to, be great to see I've that. I've got it here. Yes, great, great, yeah. great. And in fact I've also got the one that reports on the um, uh, Silverstone race Yes. as well. Yes, it would be great to have a look at those. Yeah, yes. sure. So that, so this was a, this was an upturn, this You've, you've turned motor racing upside down, really. With uh, this. Well, uh, good publicity is uh, is everything in sport. Yes. And um, uh, the uh, fuel company, we were with BP, <coughs> they immediately twigged that, you know, there was something here that was exceptional. Yes. And um, the tyre people as well, uh, yes. brake lining people, always people that, Paid for adverts on the so side of the truck and that kind of thing. Ferodo, uh, Pirelli was it? Um, Mintex. We Mintex, were with, uh, yes, yeah. yes. But Ferodo, um, I think we were with them at one stage anyway. Yes. 
And uh, that was really, uh, whilst we had been reasonably successful and uh, had become fairly well known uh, within the sport, that Empire Trophy with the list of Bristol with Archie driving uh, was really the uh, beginning of, uh, well, big time actually. Yes, yes. And was this, how long did the original Bristol engine last? Uh, it lasted the rest of the 55 season. Yes. And then at Aintree, uh, one of the last races that we were going in for, and I was looking forward to uh, selling the uh, list of Bristol uh, so that we could go on to the uh, next car, which was the Maserati engined yes. car. The very last race at Aintree. Um, I think it was a Conrad that broke. Right. And uh, came up through the side of the uh, engine. Fairly final. And uh, ruined the bloody lot. Yes, yes. I mean, it was scrap, really. Yes, yes. So it had served its purpose. I was disappointed that it hadn't lasted, but it had served its purpose for a season and a half. The next, the next car was the next Lister was a Maserati engine. But you, you went on to use Bristol engines in in, in other, other cars. <coughs> well, a lot of our customers, uh, yes, um, and we were getting customers by then. I mean, we made up four or five cars uh, with Bristol engines for um, 1955. They were a different design. Um, I'd engaged Tom Lucas, who was. Um, uh, a chap um, studying for a degree in engineering at uh, Cambridge University. <coughs> and uh, we had the facilities, uh, we were offered the facilities of their wind tunnel there. It wasn't a full size wind tunnel, but right. you could make a model up, you know, which is uh, what he did. And uh, we had the uh, two winged um, uh, list of Bristol's. Yes. Um, they weren't particularly uh, handsome cars, uh, but um, uh, they served well enough. I don't think the fins made any bloody difference, quite honestly, to uh, uh, the performance. Were in wind tunnel work, were people aware of downforces in those days, as much as they, they later <laughs> were with the spoilers? They were no, today. no. It was purely to try and. Um, cut down wind resistance and uh, uh, also to have something which was uh, um, reasonably stable. Yes, yes. And of course the wings, the tail, the twin tail wings, which are a very striking feature. Yeah. Um, and these uh, on our car sloped inwards um, to cut down uh, resistance and in fact um, there's a story that Chapman, who was also uh, using uh, wings on uh, the lotuses, uh, or fins on the lotuses, I should say, uh, he um, had said to um, Frank Costin for 55, I think that uh, uh, we should have uh, uh, fins that slope inwards. And Costin said, uh, no, that wasn't necessarily. And as soon as he saw our car, he said, I told you they should have bloody was. Yes. Because you, you'd been able to study airflow, which, of course, has to come inwards at the, yeah. the back of a car as yeah. well as well, going that over. was a theory. Yes. Yes. As I say, I don't think at the speeds that we were getting that the fins were of any great use anyway. And it rather put me off um, using too much uh, uh, aerodynamic um, um, experiments yes uh, for the uh, for the rest of the time that i was in motor racing because without being aware of down forces very much in those days um i think a lot of streamlined cars could become very light That's at speed lift. i mean that still happens today uh, yes, look yeah. at uh, dame le bens at Le Mans. what was it three or four years ago yes when they lifted off uh, well, they took off, didn't they? Yes, yes, yes. Coming and back. Um, one has to be very careful what one's doing with uh, with that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's no good having part knowledge on it. Sure. What about the 
costs in those days? What did it cost to prepare a car? What did it cost to run one? What, what did you sell your racing cars for to customers? Too little. Um, yes, <laughs> not enough. Yes. I can't remember what a kit of parts was, but um, it was only something like 500 quid, 600 quid, something like that. For a, what, for a chassis? And for a chassis, the DIN tube, wishbones, yeah. wishbone pins, um, yeah. So then it was engine and gearbox and running gear to be bought yeah. and uh, coach, coach work to be built and that would, that would be farmed out to a, a uh, panel beater, specialist yeah. coach builders yeah. who provide something. So, um, and did, did you sell completed cars? Uh, no. Um, the reason for that was that it brought in all kinds of complications <coughs> with um, purchase tax. Yes. It was car tax. Yes. As I remember. And if you sold bits and pieces, um, you didn't pay car tax, but if you sold a complete car, you did. Which is how Lotus 7s were sold yeah. in kit form with the ad advertisement right. yeah. not to 124 hours. Yeah. And the idea was you'd span the thing together in your shed with a friend and have a Lotus yeah. you know, in a weekend. So that was, um, so you produced four or five Lister Bristols, yeah. which, 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 which were sold to customers. Yes, again, they're, I think, mainly listed in the yes. Lister book. Yes, we've got, the, we've got a, list, there's a list of them in the book. And the rest of, and, but then you were moving on away from Bristol Engines, you were moving up into greater Well, greater we, uh, we started in, uh, with the Maserati, of course, the great disadvantage of the Bristol engine was its height. Yes, being a long stroke engine. Yeah, with the um, carburetors on top, yes. downdraft. And uh, I, I think it was 29 inches from sump to the top. Right. Uh, whereas the Maserati was something like 23 or 24. Yes, yes. And five inches on um, height on a body can make a lot of difference. I don't think anybody canted them over or you, they'd have to use dry sump or... Yeah, there, there was talk about doing that, uh, but uh, I can't remember anyone actually doing yes, it. Yes, yes. The Maserati Lister was next. Yeah. Um, was that a success? No. Right. Um, we had one or two wins with it, but... Um, the problem was the um, uh, the engine. Beautiful looking car. Yes. Uh, but uh, the engine was so unreliable. Yes. Um, I mean, when we uh, first took it up to Snetterden for a, a test up there, um, we saw Archie parked at Barton Mills, which is roughly halfway to Snetterden, and um, Something had happened with the timing gears. I think I can't remember exactly what it was now. Uh, and uh, we uh, came back and uh, ordered uh, some, uh, because the camshafts had been damaged, I think. Anyway, we ordered some uh, new cams from Maserati and uh, Don fitted them and uh, started the engine up. And uh, as they were going, round operating the valves so the top part of the cam was being machined by the uh, valve in other words they hadn't hardened them oh, right um, and uh, this was just typical i think on one occasion they sent us a um, piston uh, and uh, put uh, it was a casting machine as necessary Right. <laughs> so we were getting slightly disillusioned uh, with uh, Maserati. The reason we had gone to Maserati was A, the height of the engine, and B, the fact that one of the uh, uh, greatest competitors, as far as we were concerned, of the Bristol, was Roy Salvadori in uh, 
Green's A6 GCS Maserati. Yes. And uh, we found that, uh, in fact, again, with uh, certain books and photographs I've got there, you'll see that driving the uh, Maserati, how much lower it is than Archie in the, uh, in the Bristol. And I reckon if we could cut that off the frontal area, yes. with other things being equal, uh, we could have uh, walked it. Yes. The first thing was that um, Jaguars withdrew from racing. Yes. Now they were, uh, the uh, fuel companies in those days were the ones, people that really kept motor racing going. And they were with Shell. And Shell and BP in this country uh, were associated. Uh, and they didn't generally <coughs> um, race against one another too much. Esso was uh, completely independent. And in fact, <coughs> um, Aston's were, Aston Martin were on Esso. So Shell BP wanted a big sports car uh, to uh, compete with the Aston Martin set up. Yes. Yes. And uh, as Jaguars were getting out, uh, they decided that um, they would like us to uh, build uh, a Jaguar engine car to compete with Aston's. Uh, we were with BP, but as they were an associated company, that pleased Shell uh, that um, SO's uh, supporters would be given a run for their money. How? Uh, successful a run, uh, I don't think they imagined. Certainly I didn't. And of course the car was uh, a huge success right from the very beginning. Yes. Uh, the first race we had a problem at Snetterton, which was a comparatively unimportant one. We had uh, problems with um, the um, uh, the clutch operating mechanism. Yes. Uh, we put that right uh, during that race, and uh, Archie went off and broke the lap record. But of course he didn't win, having had that problem. The next race was the British Empire Trophy again, having won it in 55. Uh, we went back and he won it in 57. Yes. And uh, the, I think we entered something like 14 races, won 11, retired in one with a comparatively small amount of trouble and uh, finished uh, second in an, the, uh, one of the remaining three races. It was something like that. You were using, a, first of all, a 3.4 litre Jag engine. 3.4 with, yeah. with a wet sump to start off. No, uh, it's a dry sump. Dry sump, right. right. So you, you, which gave you, of course, a lower, yeah. lower profile. Yeah. Yes. And um, that, of course, was the, um, the story of uh, the success, the uh, Lister Jag having practiced on MG Bristol and yes. Maserati, we uh, finally hit the jackpot. Yes, yes. <coughs> how did the, so how did the racing career, how did, the, how did your racing career go after, go then? Once you got established with the Lister Jag, once you'd established the Lister Jaguar, um, we were um, supported by. We were with BP right the way through, right yes. from beginning to end, and uh, we were also uh, with Dunlop for tyres right the way through. Um, other people like Mick Dex Frodo and um, the brake people, Girling, <coughs> and. Um, Dunlop disc brakes, uh, they were competing and uh, it meant that we uh, uh, had uh, financially quite a, um, a good run. So can you recall what sort of sums would, would, would a firm like BP or would? Uh, yeah, we started off with um, probably 500 a year, something like yes, that. Yes, yes. And uh, by the time we got to the uh, to 58, I think that it was something like 
14,000, which was a hell of a lot of money then. Yes, yes. I mean, we were on getting that kind of money. Uh, Sterling Moss, at the top of his uh, earning power, got about 30,000, I think. Yes. So we were halfway towards him. And um, I think that um, uh, people like Lotus and Cooper were probably around the nine, ten, eleven thousand mark yes. at that time. Can you give us much information on the, on those points? Um, relationships with the Bristol factory? Um, <coughs> Not really. I, um, uh, I haven't really got any. Um, memories of uh, uh, dealing with them at all very much. Yes, yes. And uh, in fact, I don't think we did deal with them too much, which, you know, is as it should be, really. Yes, yes. You'd, 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 you'd get an engine. If we needed help, yes. we'd be on to them. Your, and your, tu your Don Moore would take care of tuning the engine and yeah. preparing it. Um, Anything to say about reliability of the engines? How did customers find them? <coughs> Not really. I think they uh, all found them pretty good. Yes, yes, yes. Um, did you? I mean, Tejero. He, well, he he made one or one or two Bristol engine Tejeros, didn't he? Uh, any? Did you compare notes with him? What was his? What were his findings? What was his experiences? Uh, with not that really. No. Engine? No. 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 Um, and um, so the factory didn't really need to give you much technical support. No, it, uh, it, you know, if it works, yes, yes, don't um, change it. Yes. Do we know? Do we know what John? What, do we know what Don Moore's secrets were? What were his trade secrets were? <coughs> it was really, you know, putting the engine together, any engine. Yes. Uh, ideally. Uh, well balanced and uh, fitting the things. And in those properly. days, I think they just used knife edge balancing. They didn't have dynamic balancing. Uh, dynamic balancing was available, I think. Yes. But um, he uh, he didn't have. Yes. He didn't have that. I've just had my Bristol engine dynamically balanced, and I thought it was manufactured to a very high standard. But I was quite surprised that. There were significant little amounts of metal yeah. to be to be removed in certain places. So, you know, the, the, uh, an improvement was certainly possible. Uh, my main contact there was Lofty England, and um, I had much more contact with them than I yes. did with Bristol's. But uh, I couldn't say that uh, there was anything fundamental in what we talked about at all. Uh, can you remember, can you remember, what did a Bristol racing engine cost, a Bristol sports engine cost you? Would it be about, I don't know, 1,200, 1,500 quid? Quite, quite possibly. I mean, the cars were 3,000 to 4,000. Yeah. I mean, it's a bloody long time ago, you know, that uh, all this happened. Uh, uh, and... Um, uh, a lot has happened in my life yes. since then. Well, I was still in short trousers and he wasn't born. So. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> and uh, one's memory as you get older, um, especially if you've been concentrating on a lot of other stuff, yes, like uh, yes, yes. getting barns in the uh, right state of repair and everything, yes. uh, you tend to forget some of the... Um, Possibly significant things. So the rest of the the rest of the list of story. How did how did things go from the from when you started uh, so successfully with Jaguar engines? How did the rest of how what was the rest of your racing history after that? <coughs> well, the uh, uh, the next big thing was um, uh, because w when I was asked to do this uh, Jaguar engine car I was a bit reluctant because I felt that the um, uh, it was with the, the weight of the Jaguar engine that we were getting fairly near the uh, limits of yes. the chassis yes. and I was 
thinking it over whether I should do it or not. And I came back and talked it over with Don Moore, and uh, he said, um, I think you'll be all right. He said, you know, if you can make a success of it, uh, you might get the Americans interested. Yes. Briggs Cunningham, for example. Yes. Well, we had that conversation that must have been uh, in somewhere around about uh, September, October of 1956 when we decided to do it. And a year later, Briggs Cunning was over trying the car at Snetterton. Wow. So, uh, you know, it shows the kind of success uh, that um, happened. Yes. yes. And um, that Don had been pretty far-sighted. And, of course, that really was um, a big boost for us, you know, to have uh, the Cunningham team running the cars for two years. And not only that, uh, winning practically every race that they entered. Yes. As we had yes. done in 57. Yes, yes. And Archie? He, he uh, was um, successful when he went to New Zealand with the old car. Um, a photograph on the front of Autosport the next weekend after the New Zealand Grand Prix, which was a form of Libres, showing Archie on the outside of a corner, um, challenging the uh, two cars that were running first and second yes. in uh, the New Zealand Grand Prix, which wasn't bad publicity for us. Terrific. Yes. And um, uh, he won two races out there, I think, uh, unfortunately, he uh, retired in the uh, uh, New Zealand Grand Prix. But of course, 58, uh, as far as I'm concerned, was a bloody awful year for uh, <coughs> our own team because that was the year that Archie was killed. Yes, yes. At uh, Spa in Belgium. Yes. That was um, <coughs> a nightmare and things were never the same after that. I mean, we had some good drivers and um, pretty decent people um, uh, doing the driving, but uh, the relationship that we had with Archie was obviously very special indeed. Yes, yes. You were there when the accident happened. Yeah. Yes, yes. It must have been a must have been an awful, awful shock. It, uh, it was terrible, terrible, and um, <clears throat> it was, um, it came off at the same corner that, um, or the same curve that um, <clears throat> Dick Seaman had crashed his Mercedes uh, in 1959 when he was burned, and yes. he was taken to the same hospital that yes, yes. Seaman was taken to. <coughs> And, uh, you know, a lot of the fun went out of racing then. Yes. As you can imagine. Yes. Because he'd, he'd been with you from the start. He'd, yeah. He'd triggered, he'd triggered the whole thing off. Yeah. And he'd um, been a key, yeah. a key part of the whole. Well, there were three of us. Uh, you know, there was yes. Archie, Donmore and myself. Yes. Uh, that um, uh, achieved that, apart from the chaps in the background, our own <coughs> uh, workers who were exceptionally good. Yes. How many people did you have in the factory at that time in the works? <sighs> I don't know, uh, probably about 25 people yes. in the works, but uh, as far as involved in making the cars, um, four or five. Yes. The rest of them were working on our general engineering stuff. Yes, yes. And this was, you know, and this was still good publicity for you. It was, oh, it was yeah. good business. It brought yeah, in attention. It's been yes. very good publicity ever since. Yes, terrific. It's got yes. 
me in uh, with quite a lot of, um, you know, big time uh, contracts with people like ICI Plastics, for example. And this was years ago. Yes. But uh, it got me in there. Yes. When did the racing, when did your racing program end? Uh, in uh, August, uh, I think it was a, either late July or early August, 1959. Yes. Uh, the, the other driver who took over, as far as Archie was concerned, was either Buweb, and um, he had won Le Mans on two occasions. Um, and um, he uh, went over to, uh, to France, clermont Ferrand, uh, for a Formula 2 team, and uh, he crashed there. This was uh, in the July of uh, 59, and he was our works driver. Uh, we had uh, heard that he was, you know, fairly badly uh, knocked about. Um, we had also uh, negotiated, or started negotiations to offer Jean Bayer, the uh, French driver, yes. um, a position for next year. And um, we were at Brands Hatch ourselves on this particular weekend. And um, one of the cars um, was pretty badly damaged in uh, an accident. The driver was all right. And um, on the radio on the way back, uh, I heard that Jean Bera had died yes. uh, through an accident. I think it was at the Arvis Ring in Germany. And when I got in, uh, which was a, roughly a week after our, um, I had gone into hospital. My wife, Josie, said uh, they'd been on the phone from France and I was just died. Yes. So uh, I thought, you know, this is bloody terrible. This is yes. the time to get out. Yes. And yes. Uh, I made up my mind then to, uh, to finish with it, withdraw immediately. Yes. yes. So how many cars did you make altogether? Uh, I don't honestly know. We made um, 48 cars or something yes. like that, of which only 55 have lasted. Yes, yes. <laughs> there's, still, there's still plenty around. And so, so some well, of they're easy to copy, you see. Yes, I mean, I yes. um, designed them so they could be made with fairly universal machine tools, lathes, yes, yes. milling machines, this kind of thing. And um, a lot of people have made them up. Yes, yes. So in fact, some of the most successful ones have never even seen Cambridge. But <laughs> that um, says a bit for the design, I think. I think it says lots for the design. <laughs>
Uh, it lasted the rest of the 55 season. Yes. And then at Aintree, uh, one of the last races that we were going in for, and I was looking forward to uh, selling the uh, list of Bristol uh, so that we could go on to the uh, next car, which was the Maserati engined yes. car. The very last race at Aintree, um, I think it was a Conrad that broke. Right. And uh, came up through the side of the engine. Fairly final. And uh, ruined the bloody lot. Yes, yes. I mean, it was scrap, really. Yes, yes. So it had served its purpose. I was disappointed that it hadn't lasted, but it had served its purpose for a season and a half. The next, the next car was the next lister was a Maserati engine. But you, you went on to use Bristol engines in in, in other, other cars. <coughs> well, a lot of our customers, uh, yes, um, and we were getting customers by then. I mean, we made up four or five cars uh, with Bristol engines for um, 1955. They were a different design. Um, I'd engaged Tom Lucas, who was um, uh, a chap um, studying for a degree in engineering at uh, Cambridge University. <coughs> and uh, we had the facilities, uh, we were offered the facilities of their wind tunnel there. It wasn't a full-size wind tunnel, but right. you could make a model up, you know, which is... Uh, what he did, and uh, we had the uh, two-winged um, uh, list of Bristols. Yes. Um, they weren't particularly uh, handsome cars, uh, but um, uh, they served well enough. I don't think the fins made any bloody difference, quite honestly, to uh, uh, the performance. Were in wind tunnel work, were people aware of downforces in those days? as much as they, they later were with spoilers. They were no, today. No. It was purely to try and um, cut down wind resistance and uh, uh, also to have something which was uh, um, reasonably stable. Yes, yes. And of course the wings, the tail, the twin tail wings, which are a very striking feature. Yeah, um, and these uh, on our car sloped inwards um, to cut down uh, resistance and in fact um, there's a story that Chapman who was also uh, using uh, wings on uh, the lotuses uh, or fins on the lotuses I should say uh, he um, had said to um, Frank Costin for 55 I think that uh, uh, we should have uh, uh, fins that slope inwards and Costin said uh, no that wasn't necessarily and as soon as he saw our car he said I told you they should have bloody was yes. because you you'd been able to study airflow which of course has to come inwards at yeah. the back of a car as yeah. well as well, going that over. was a theory yes. yes as I say I don't think at the speeds that we were getting that the fins were of any great use anyway and it rather put me off um, using too much uh, uh, aerodynamic um, um, experiments yes. uh, for the uh, for the rest of the time that I was in motor racing. Because without being aware of downforces very much in those days, um, I think a lot of streamlined cars could become very light that's in speed. Lift. I mean, that yeah, still happens today. Uh, yes, look yeah. at uh, Dame LeBans at Le Mans. What was it? Three or four years ago. Yes. When they lifted off, uh, well, they took off, didn't they? Yes, yes, yes. Coming and um, one has to be very careful what one's doing with uh, with that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's no good having part knowledge on it. Sure. What about the costs in those days? What did it cost to prepare a car? What did it cost to run one? What, what did you sell your racing cars for to customers? Too little. Um, yes, <laughs> not enough. Yes. I can't remember what a kit of parts was, but um, it was only something like 500 quid, 600 quid, something like that. For a, what, for a chassis? And for a chassis, the DIN tube, wishbones, 
yeah. wishbone pins. Um, yeah. So then it was engine and gearbox and running gear to be bought. Yeah. And uh, coach coach work to be built, and that would that would be farmed out to a, a uh, panel beater, especially yeah. coach builders yeah. who provide something. So. Um, and did, did you sell completed cars? Uh, no. Um, the reason for that was that it brought in all kinds of complications <coughs> with um, purchase tax. Yes. It was car tax. Yes. As I remember it. And if you sold bits and pieces, um, you didn't pay car tax, but if you sold a complete car, you did. Which is how Lotus Sevens were sold, yeah, in kit form with the ad advertisement right. yeah. not to 124 hours, yeah, and the idea was you'd spanner the thing together in your shed with a friend and have a Lotus, yeah, you know, in the weekend. So that was um, so you produced four or five Lister Bristols, yeah, which, which 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 were sold to customers. Yes, again there I think. Mainly listed in the yes, list of books. Yes, we've got the, we've got a list. There's a list of them in the book, and the rest of and but then you were moving on away from Bristol engines. You were moving up into greater. Well, greater we capacity. Uh, we started in uh, with the Maserati. Of course, the great disadvantage of the Bristol engine was its height. Yes, long, being a long stroke engine. Yeah, with the um, carburetors on top. Yes, downdraft, and. Uh, I, I think it was 29 inches from sump to the top. Right. Uh, whereas the Maserati was something like 23 or 24. Yes, yes. And five inches on um, a height on a body can make a lot of difference. I don't think anybody canted them over or you, they'd have to use dry sump or yeah, there, there was talk about doing that, uh, but uh, I can't remember anyone actually doing it. Yes, that. yes. The Maserati Lister was next. Yeah. Um, was that a success? No. Right. Um, we had one or two wins with it, but um, the problem was the um, uh, the engine. Beautiful looking car. Yes. Uh, but uh, the engine was so unreliable. Yes. Um, I mean, when we uh, first took it up to Snetterdam for a, a test up there, um, we saw Archie parked at Barton Mills, which is roughly halfway to Snetterdam, and um, something had happened with the timing gears. I think I can't remember exactly what it was now. Uh, and uh, we uh, came back and uh, ordered uh, some uh, because the camshafts had been damaged, I think. Anyway, we ordered some uh, new cams from Maserati, and uh, Don fitted them and uh, started the engine up. And uh, as they were going round operating the valves, so the top part of the cam was being machined by the uh, valve. In other words, they hadn't hardened them. Right. Um, and uh, this was just typical. I think on one occasion they sent us a um, piston uh, and uh, put, uh, it was a casting, machine as necessary. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we were getting slightly disillusioned uh, with uh, Maserati. The reason we had gone to Maserati was A, the height of the engine, and B, the fact that one of the uh, uh, greatest competitors, as far as we were concerned, of the Bristol, was Roy Salvadori in uh, Green's A6 GCS Maserati. Yes. And uh, we felt that, uh, in fact, again, with uh, certain books and photographs I've got there, you'll see that driving the uh, Maserati, how much lower it is than Archie in the uh, in the Bristol. And I reckon if we could cut that off the frontal area, yes. all other things being equal, 
uh, we could have uh, walked it. Yes. The first thing was that um, Jaguars withdrew from racing. Yes. Now they were uh, the uh, fuel companies in those days were the ones people that really kept motor racing going, and they were with Shell. And Shell and BP in this country uh, were associated, uh, and they didn't generally <coughs> um, race against one another too much. Esso was uh, completely independent, and in fact, <coughs> um, Aston's were Aston Martin were on Esso, so Shell BP wanted a big sports car uh, to uh, compete with the Aston Martin yes. setup. Yes. And uh, as Jaguars were getting out, uh, they decided that um, they would like us to uh, build uh, a Jaguar engine car to compete with Aston's. Uh, we were with BP, but as they were an associated company, that pleased Shell. Uh, that um, Esso's uh, supporters would be given a run for the money. How uh, successful a run, uh, I don't think they imagined. Certainly I didn't. And of course the car was uh, a huge success right from the very beginning. Yes. Uh, the first race we had a problem at Snetterton, which was a comparatively unimportant one. We had uh, problems with um, the um, uh, the clutch operating mechanism. Yes. Uh, we put that right uh, during that race, and uh, Archie went off and broke the lap record. But of course, he didn't win, having had that problem. The next race was the British Empire Trophy again, having won it in '55. Uh, we went back, and he won it in '57. Yes. And uh, uh, I think we entered something like 14 races, won 11, retired in one with a comparatively small amount of trouble, and uh, finished uh, second in an, the, uh, one of the remaining three races. It was something like that. You were using, a, first of all, a 3.4 litre Jag engine. 3.4 with, with a wet sump to start. Uh, no, uh, a it's a dry sump. Dry, dry sump, right, right. So you, you, which gave you, of course, a lower, yeah, lower profile. Yeah. Yes. And um, that, of course, was the um, the story of uh, the success. The uh, Lister Jag, having practiced on MG Bristol and yes. Maserati, we uh, finally hit the jackpot. Yes. Yes. <coughs> How did the so how did the racing career how did the how did your racing career go after go then once you got established with the Lister Jag once you'd established the Lister Jaguar? Um, we were um, supported by we were with BP right the way through right yes. from beginning to end, and uh, we were also uh, with Dunlop for tyres right the way through. Um, other people like Mick Dex Frodo and. Um, the brake people, Girling <coughs> and um, Dunlop disc brakes, uh, they were competing and uh, it meant that we uh, uh, had uh, financially quite a, um, a good run. So can you recall what sort of sums would, would, would a firm like BP? Or would uh, yeah, we started off with um, probably 500 a year, something like yes, that. Yes, yes. And uh, by the time we got to the, uh, to 58, I think that it was something like 14,000, which was a hell of a lot of money then. Yes, yes. I mean, we were on getting that kind of money. Uh, Sterling Moss at the top of his uh, earning power got about 30,000, I think. Yes. So we were halfway towards him. And um, 
I think that um, uh, people like Lotus and Cooper were probably around the nine, ten, eleven thousand mark yes. at that time. Can you give us much information on that on those points? Um, relationships with the Bristol factory? Uh, <coughs> Not really. I, um, uh, I haven't really got any um, memories of uh, uh, dealing with them at all very yes, much. Yes, yes. And uh, in fact, I don't think we did deal with them too much, which, you know, is as it should be, really. Yes, yes. You'd, 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 you'd get an engine. If we needed help, yes. we'd be on to them. Your, and your, tu your Don Moore would take care of tuning the engine and preparing yeah. it. Um, anything to say about reliability of the engines? How did customers find them? <coughs> Not really. I think they uh, all found them pretty good. Yes, yes, yes. Um, did you, I mean, Tejero, he, well, he, he made one or, one or two Bristol engine Tejeros, didn't he? Uh, and he, did you compare notes with him? What was his? What were his findings? What was his experiences? Uh, with not that really. No. no, no. no. Um, and um, so the factory didn't really need to give you much technical support. No, it, uh, it, you know, if it works. Yes. Yes. Don't um, change it. Yes. Do we know? Do we know what John? What, do we know what Don Moore's secrets were? What were his trade secrets were? <coughs> It was really, you know, putting the engine together, any engine. Yes. Uh, ideally, uh, well balanced and uh, fitting the things. And in those properly. days, I think they just used knife edge balancing. They didn't have dynamic balancing. Uh, dynamic balancing was available, I think. Yes. But um, he uh, he didn't have. Yes. He didn't have that. I've just had my Bristol engine dynamically balanced and. I thought it was manufactured to very high standard, but I was quite surprised that there were significant little amounts of metal yeah. to be to be removed in certain places. So, you know, the, the, uh, an improvement was certainly possible. Uh, my main contact there was Lofty England, and um, I had much more contact with them than I yes. did with Bristol's. But uh, I couldn't say that uh, there was anything fundamental in what we talked about at all. Uh, can, you remember, can you remember, what did a Bristol racing engine cost, a Bristol sports engine cost you? Would it be about, I don't know, 1,200, 1,500 quid? Quite, quite possibly. I mean, the cars were 3,000 to 4,000. Yeah. I mean, it's a bloody long time ago, you know, that uh, all this happened. <laughs> uh, uh, and, um, uh, a lot has happened in my life yes. since then. Well, I was still in short trousers and he wasn't born. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and uh, one's memory as you get older, um, especially if you've been, been concentrating on a lot of other stuff, yes, like uh, yes, yes. getting barns in the uh, right state of repair and everything, yes. uh, you tend to forget some of the... Um, Possibly significant things. So the rest of the the rest of the list of story. How did how did things go from the from when you started uh, so successfully with Jaguar engines? How did the rest of how what was the rest of your racing history after that? <coughs> well, the uh, uh, the next big thing was um, uh, because w when I was asked to do this uh, Jaguar engine car I was a bit reluctant because I felt that the um, uh, it was with the, the weight of the Jaguar engine that we were getting fairly near the uh, limits of yes. the chassis yes. and I was thinking it over whether I should do it or not and I came back and talked it over with Don Moore, and uh, he said, um, I think you'll be all right. He said, you know, if you can make a success of it, uh, you might get the Americans interested. Yes. Briggs Cunningham, for example. Yes. Well, we had that conversation 
that must have been uh, in somewhere around about uh, September, October of 1956 when we decided to do it. And a year later, Briggs Cunning was over trying the car at Snetterton. Wow. So, uh, you know, it shows the kind of success uh, that um, happened. Yes. yes. And um, that Don had been pretty far sighted. And of course, that really was um, a big boost for us, you know, to have uh, the Cunningham team running the cars for two years and not only that uh winning practically every race that they entered yes as we're done in 57. yes yes and archie he he uh, was um successful when he went to new zealand with the old car um a photograph on the front of autosport the next weekend after the New Zealand Grand Prix, which was a form of Libres, showing Archie on the outside of a corner, um, challenging the uh, two cars that were running first and second yes. in uh, the New Zealand Grand Prix, which wasn't bad publicity for us. Terrific. Yes. And um, uh, he won two races out there, I think, uh, unfortunately, he uh, retired in the uh, uh, New Zealand Grand Prix. But of course, 58, uh, as far as I'm concerned, was a bloody awful year for uh, <coughs> our own team because that was the year that Archie was killed. Yes, yes. At uh, Spa in Belgium. Yes. That was um, <coughs> a nightmare and things were never the same after that. I mean, we had some good drivers and um, pretty decent people um, uh, doing the driving, but uh, the relationship that we had with Archie was obviously very special indeed. Yes, yes. You were there when the accident happened? Yeah. Yes, yes. It must have been a, must have been an awful, awful shock. It, uh, it was terrible, terrible, and um, <clears throat> it was, um, it came off at the same corner that, um, or the same curve that um, <clears throat> Dick Seaman had crashed his Mercedes uh, in 1959 when he was burned, and yes. he was taken to the same hospital that yes, yes. Seaman was taken to. <coughs> And, uh, you know, a lot of the fun went out of racing then. Yes. As you can imagine. Yes. Because he'd, he'd been with you from the start. He'd, yeah. He'd triggered, he'd triggered the whole thing off. Yeah. And he'd um, been a key, yeah. a key part of the whole. Well, there were three of us. Uh, you project, know, there was yes. Archie, Donmore and myself. Yes. That um, uh, achieved that apart from the chaps in the background, our own <coughs> uh, workers who were exceptionally good. Yes. How many people did you have in the factory at that time in the works? <sighs> I don't know, uh, probably about 25 people yes. in the works, but uh, as far as involved in making the cars, um, four or five. Yes. The rest of them were working on our general engineering stuff. Yes, yes. And this was, you know, and this was still good publicity for you. It was, oh, it was yeah. good business. It brought yeah, in it's attention. Been yes. Very good publicity ever since. Yes, terrific. Got yes. me in uh, with quite a lot of, um, you know, big time uh, contracts with people like ICI Plastics, for example. Uh, and this was years ago. Yes. But uh, it got me in there. Yes. When did the racing, when did your racing program end? Uh, in uh, August, uh, I think it was the 
either late July or early August 1959. Yes. Uh, the, new, the other driver who took over, as far as Archie was concerned, was Ivan Buweb. And um, he had won Le Mans on two occasions. Um, and um, he uh, went over to, uh, to France, Clermont Ferrand, uh, for a Formula 2 team, and uh, he crashed there. This was uh, in the July of uh, 59, and he was our works driver. Uh, we had uh, heard that he was, you know, fairly badly uh, knocked about. Um, we had also uh, negotiated, or started negotiations to offer Jean Bayer, the uh, French driver, yes. um, a position for next year. And um, we were at Brands Hatch ourselves on this particular weekend. And um, one of the cars um, was pretty badly damaged in uh, an accident. The driver was all right. And um, on the radio on the way back, uh, I heard that Jean Bera had died yes. uh, through an accident. I think it was at the Arvis Ring in Germany. And when I got in, uh, uh, which was a, roughly a week after our, um, I had gone into hospital. My wife, Josie, said uh, they'd been on the phone from France and I was just died. Yes. So uh, I thought, you know, this is bloody terrible. This is yes. a time to get out. Yes. And yes. Uh, I made up my mind then to, uh, to finish with it, withdrew immediately. Yes. yes. So how many cars did you make all together? Uh, I don't honestly know. We made um, 48 cars or something yes. like that, of which only 55 have lasted. Yes, yes. <laughs> There's still, there still plenty around. And so, so some well, of them they're are easy to copy. You see. Yes, I mean, yes. I um, designed them so they could be made with fairly universal machine tools, lathes, yes, yes. milling machines, this kind of thing. And um, a lot of people have made them up. Yes, yes. So In fact, some of the most successful ones have never even seen Cambridge, but <laughs> right. that um, says a bit for the design, I expect. I think it says lots for the design. 